So this is the first time that my, uh, my, my, my history of working department maintenance was ever in, in my int introduction to a speech. But actually, you know, I, as I think back about that job, uh, that was when I first began to realize just how valuable everybody is in a market economy. Because it was my job to, um, well, I had two main things that I felt primarily responsible for in that job. One was changing the toilet paper in the restrooms. And you know, it occurred to me one day, I thought, if I don't do my job right, very bad things could happen. <laughs> and this department store could lose all of its customers very quickly. <laughs> so uh, I had a profound sense of responsibility. Another thing that I had to do in that job, uh, this is very interesting. You know, they have changing rooms in department stores, and people take the pens out of clothes and they hurl them on the ground, you know, like that. And then they walk away. So I had to go through the changing rooms every night with my hands very carefully trying to find the stick pins on the ground. And I knew that if I missed one, that the very next day somebody could come in and step on a pin that could shoot through their foot and they'd have a big bloody foot and it would be a disaster, right? So I had a profound sense of responsibility. Um, so I was, I was a lowly and pathetic young man earning the minimum wage, which at the time was, was uh, very low. Uh, but I had a profound sense of responsibility. It's like, it's weird. I thought, I, in a weird sense, my, this whole fate of this department store rests on, on the job that I do. And it was kind of an, an amazing revelation for a young man. I felt really valuable. That's what markets do to us. I mean, they, they encourage us to find value within ourselves and to live out that value in a responsible way. I think that was the moment when I first fell in love with markets because um, otherwise, you know, sitting in public school, I mean, you're not really very valuable to anybody, you know? But if you have a job and people are depending on you to be responsible and, and the outcome of that business enterprise rests and very much so on how you do your job, that changes your outlook towards the world, which is one of the great tragedies I think of at our time that young people no longer have the opportunities that I had when I was that age because now the enforcement of child labor laws is so severe. Um, uh, like, I, I, I could just lie, right? When I walked into the department store, they said, well, you're, are you 16? I said, oh, well, sure. Well, I was 13, you know. But um, nowadays, you can't get away with that because everything's so strict. So people are excluded from the job market. So they're excluded from any kind of contact with commercial society. And um, it's also weirdly unfashionable among the bourgeoisie for the children to work. It's like, no, you must stay in school and make straight A's, you know? Well, so then they graduate from college at the age of 22 with no experience whatsoever, with, a, with no sense of like what's, how the world works or anything going on. And they don't understand how to be valuable to others and how to value other people. You know, they just understand how to live within a machine, a bureaucratic machine that's been constructed for them. And I think it's a calamity, really. Um, I don't know, of all the public policy changes I'd like to see, I'd like to see child labor laws like completely repealed, actually. Uh, you know, I was in a speech the other day and I've been speaking for two hours and somebody said, yeah, but what about child labor? What are you gonna do about that problem? And I was just exhausted. I said, well, I'm actually for it. And took the next question. <laughs> 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 I sort of am, actually, I think. I think, I think commerce provides a wonderful training ground for life. It's something that, that helps us understand value, helps us understand other people, helps us understand um, how to get along, how to appreciate, and as the topic of this lecture says, how to love. Now I know that the lecture sounds like it has an implausible title. And it truly did take me many years to warm up to publicly talk about what I have long believed inside my heart, which is that capitalism and love are bound up with each other. But it's such an outrageous thought, and I was a little bit embarrassed to state it publicly. Well, you turn 50, you know, <laughs> you start telling the truth. I don't know what to say. So I like to tell that truth. But also, to first thank the Acton Institute for having me, which is a wonderful honor in some way. You know, it's true, I've known Father since, uh, since very, very early on, before the Acton Institute was founded. And it was a brilliant flash of insight he, he had uh, about the unity of liberty and, and religion. 
Uh, maybe it's obvious to all of you. Yeah, they go together, sure. Of course we have to have a think tank. Well, why is Acton the only one? I mean, how come it didn't exist before Father created it, you know? Because nobody really had thought that through. And yet, the whole history of, particularly the 20th century, but all of history, um, is about those two subjects. It's about the striving for, for human liberty and the right to live out your faith in a way that informs your commercial and public life. Um, I remember uh, reading a, uh, it was a kind of biography of one of the early um, American tourists to the Bolshevik uh, Revolution, one of, one of the early socialists in America, these, these beautiful idealists that imagined that they could just get rid of all traditions and all property and all religion and create a glorious utopia. So they traveled over to the Bolshevik Revolution and this guy uh, had stayed around for about 10 years afterwards and was mortified at what he saw. And he wrote in, in his memoirs, he said, at some point he and all of his colleagues had this horrifying thought that <laughs> they were there to help the Russian people. It turned out all they were doing was taking away from them the three things they loved the most. Um, their liberties, their property, and their religion. <coughs> Like, that's the worst thing you could ever happen to people, you know? And yet their intellectual delusions led them to do this. So liberty and, and property and faith all go together. They're inseparable. They're part of human history and they're part of the fabric of who we are and what we want to do and what we want to believe. I think they're more bound up than we think. We tend to think of these things as separate categories. People often ask me things like, yeah, but how does your uh, Christianity impact your economics? Or how does your, impact, how does your economic understanding impact your own faith? And I'm always slightly confused by the question because the question presumes these separate boxes, you know? They're like separate categories, like here's religion you know, and here's economics. But I don't see it that way. I mean, if something is true, it should be true in every field of life. If something is true, it should be true for your faith and your religion. If something is true in economics, it should be integrated well with your faith. If something is true in your faith, it should be integratable to your economics. I have no shyness whatsoever about seeing all these things as a, as a, as a unity. And the Acton Institute sees it that same way. The only thing that's troubling about coming to the Acton Institute, I don't know if you experienced this, but you walk in and so many books, right? So many, and, and you look at the shelves and you, and you just begin to kind of, your mouth begins to water, you know? You're like, oh, I'd love to read that. Oh, but I'd love to read that. Oh, and that one too. And so then you, you sort of think, I could actually live here for years. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Doing nothing but appreciating the great writings. So I'm so grateful for this institution. So capitalism and love. Can I first lay out some definitions of terms? Because as you've undoubtedly noticed, there's a lot of confusion about what capitalism is. And uh, I like the term for reasons I'll explain, and I'm not willing to give it up. I'd be happy to give it up if this is the only way we can make progress. I'm not wedded to it in some sense, but, but I like it. Um, I think of capitalism, well, imagine this scenario. Somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I hate chicken. You go, well, to each his own. Why don't you like it? Well, I don't like it because, um, because uh, of all the, it's, the meat is brown, and the animal that it comes from moves, and it's got this, this hoof, and it chews grass. And at some point you realize, I think you're not sure what a chicken is, actually, and how it's distinguished from a cow, right? So you want to kind of clarify to the person. I feel this way when people talk about capitalism a lot of times. They talk about capitalism. Well, what's wrong with capitalism? Well, it's a system by which the rich exploit the poor uh, and get bailed out, you know, uh, as it happened in 2008, or, or it brings war to people. Uh, it steals property from, from the poor and, ex and exploits people. Uh, it excludes women and minorities. And you just want to say, well, hold on, and stop right there. Are you talking about the current system or are you talking about actual capitalism? Because those are very different things. When I speak about capitalism, um, I'm not talking about bailouts, I'm not talking about war, I'm not talking about exploitation and exclusion. I'm talking about a system, a social system, I don't even like the word system, I like to think of it as an emergent order, that's rooted in two fundamental principles, free association 
and the private ownership of property. And that's it. There's no more to it than that. You can associate with whom you want on any terms that you want. And the property that uh, you're exchanging with others is yours. And you're free to trade it. That's it. That's how I define capitalism. So you might ask, well, in light of that, why don't we call it something else? I mean, why don't you call it the exchange economy? I'm OK with that. That's good. Call it the exchange economy. Um, or free enterprise, if you want. Or, or just, really, society, which is really well, all it is. Uh, the reason we call it capitalism is because of that word capital. It, capital is a very specific thing. And the economics literature is exactly right about this. Capital is the produced products, uh, is, is, is the production of products designed not for consumption, but for further production. That's all capital really means. Uh, it means that you're busy making things not to be immediately consumed, but which are designed to make other things and produce other things so that you can have an extended order of production. That's what makes possible the division of labor. And my friends, capital is absolutely, and empirically and historically, essential to uh, growing prosperity. Without capital, uh, we would not be able to feed 8 billion people. Without capital, we would not have doubled uh, the lifespan in the last 100 years. Without capital, uh, the world would be unrecognizable as, as, as it is today. So capital is an absolutely essential institution, and that's why I like the term capitalism to describe the exchange economy, because this is an institution is really great. Lots of people are, are friendly to the idea of exchange and peaceful association, but somehow don't get it through their heads that you have to have capital in order to have prosperity. You go to any poor country in the world, what do you observe? You see people who are creative, uh, hardworking, sometimes ridiculously hardworking, much har harder working than all of us in this room. Uh, they're trading a lot, they're exchanging a lot, there are markets everywhere. Why isn't wealth happening? Why aren't they getting rich? Um, it's because of the absence of capital. Because every time somebody begins to accumulate capital and invest it over the long term, some other jerk comes along and loots it. That's basically it. It could be a private party, a private criminal gang, or it could be a public official. Uh, very little difference, actually, <laughs> for the most part these days. Um, whatever it is that's attacking capital, they're attacking the fundamentals of, of prosperity. So that's what I mean by capitalism. If by capitalism you mean something else, then I would like to change the term. Uh, because that's, that's all it really comes down to. Yes, the history of capitalism has been replete with privileges for the elites. Corporations have long been linked up with government to do bad things. Uh, there have been terrible, a terrible history. Of, of government and business working together in the name of capitalism. I don't consider that capitalism. I consider it uh, somebody else. There are many terms you could call it. Crony capitalism is one term thrown around. I don't much like the term crony capitalism because it's not capitalism. So just because you add the word crony to it doesn't, you know, that's a very strange usage. I actually prefer the, to the term fascism to describe uh, non capitalistic, non socialistic systems. So it's not total socialism, but it's not capitalism either. Fascism, it sounds like I'm cursing, like, oh, it's a fascist, right? It sounds like a bad word. Actually, this is a system. It's a real system that was invented in the 1920s. It had a huge influence all over world economies. It was tried in Italy, tried in the US, tried in the UK, tried in Germany, tried in Spain, uh, and still uh, the remnants of it are still with us today. I like to get rid of those remnants, but I think that's the best term to describe what people call today a mixed economy. Um, so where does capitalism come from? And, and I, you know, I, I think this is an extremely important thing for us to think through. So I'd like to use it just a few minutes, and I'm sad about how little time we have together, but I would like to just use a few minutes to, to tell you a little bit of a conjectural history of the origin of, of ex exchange. And I think it'd help you understand something about why we have to have private property and why we have to have free association and exchange in order to have prosperity. And the, the history I'm about to tell is not entirely conjectural. It actually is the same story that anthropologists have told us from their research actually really happened. And the story is this. There's a small tribe of people, and um, they have needs, just like we have, and it's food, clothing, and shelter. Shelter's not that big a problem. If you find a good cave, um, it can last for generations. Uh, even clothing is not dreadful. If you're willing to wear animal skins, those can last for many years. It's not a daily thing. You don't have to constantly create clothes. But food, now that's another matter. 
That's something we need every single day. It's terrible. It's oppressive. It's, it's the worst thing that happens. This is why this is the Valley of Tears, the Lacrimal and Valley, because every day uh, we're going to need food. It's one of the great ironies to me today that um, capitalism has given us uh, the problem of obesity. <laughs> I mean, first world problem, right? I mean, come on. Most all of human history has been afflicted by an absence of food. But it wasn't always that, case, although always that way. Anthropologists have told us there are certain spots in the world and certain tribes in which food was readily available just because it was granted to us by nature. So imagine a small tribe, and there's plenty of things around to eat. So every tree had lots of berries on it. There were lots of slow-moving animals. You can't catch the fast ones because you don't have cars or bikes or anything like that. Um, so you've got to have slow-moving animals like, uh, like goats or uh, turtles are ideals, you know. Um, and they lay eggs and you, you know. So, and there's, so there's plenty of food for everybody. And uh, uh, there's no reason to, to have anything like a systematic sense of private property under those conditions. Because there doesn't seem to be scarcity. There's enough to go around. But inevitably, in this community like this, where everybody's being well fed, there's a lot of reproduction, and the population begins to grow. And what develops is what's called the tragedy of the commons. Um, uh, uh, since there's no private property, there's no distinction between mine and thine, people begin to consume too much and take more than they probably should relative to the needs of the whole community. It happens very quickly once people see the food uh, 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 supply begin to diminish. There's a massive raid on it, and it all goes away. And anthropologists have told us this story. This is what happens. <coughs> so you wake up one day, and you're like, there's no food, and I'm pretty darn hungry. What am I going to do? You have to look out further for food and further for food. But in this community, there's one guy. You know, he's Bob the Caveman. I don't know what his name is. Um, but he figures out that, you know, this whole idea of living hand to mouth and hunting and gathering and foraging out for uh, these relatively disgusting tasting leaves on the ground um, and these uh, bugs, I'm sick of them. I'm going to uh, capture some goats and put them uh, near my cave and uh, encourage them to reproduce. And from them, I will get milk and meat. And I will see them multiply. And that way, I can provide for my family. But in so doing, you have to kind of fence them in and domesticate them. This is the origin of the domestication of animals. And it works. Suddenly, Bob the caveman is wealthier than anybody else around him. So how do his neighbors respond to this, looking over and seeing this guy with goats? Uh, enjoying fabulous butter and milk, you know, every single morning and wearing very cool goat skins and eating big goat legs every night, you know. Now, there are two ways you can respond to this. Uh, you can hate his guts and say he's got too much and that's evil and uh, I envy him and let's gang up on him and kill him and steal his goats. And you might do that several times, right? Until at some point somebody figures out, you know, Rather than just attacking him and hating him, why don't we learn from him and become friends with him? So this is an entrepreneur. So somebody else says, you know, he's got goats, but he doesn't have a lot of vegetables. Maybe I'll raise some vegetables. So he too fences in a small area outside of his cave and begins to grow things and discovers that he can trade. This is Jim, the caveman, is now trading with Bob, the caveman, and they've got a burgeoning economy. And pretty soon, everybody learns, listen, we've got to have a system of ownership around here. Because if we do that, we can cooperate together and generate real wealth. That's amazing. That's a great insight. People ask, what's the greatest invention in history? Private property. That's the best invention that anybody ever came up with. It's a technology. It's a technology that generates wealth and leads to human association. And with that comes for the first time in this world of scarcity, the origin of affection that people have for each other. Suddenly, Jim sees Bob as valuable, and Bob sees Jim as valuable. That alone is amazing. It's something that you and I experience every single day, and it never fails to inspire me. Every single exchange that I engage in in my daily life inspires me. The reason is 
somewhat mystical and magical. Because if you think about it, um, Jim has his vegetables, Bob has his goats, they come together, trades a goat for a big bunch of vegetables, they go apart, one says thank you, the other one says thank you. They are both better off than they were before. They are both wealthier than they are before. Because Bob had a goat that he values less than Jim's vegetables, Jim had vegetables he values less than Bob's goat, so they make a switch. This, nothing has changed about the physical world, but something else has dramatically changed. It's internal. It's something about the human heart and the human mind that has changed. You feel and believe yourself better off than you were before. That is a form of wealth creation. That's the first form of wealth creation. It happens without any change in the physical availability of goods and services. It happens because there's a change in the human heart. That's extraordinary. And this goes on in our lives every single day, all day. It happened to me this morning when I bought a cup of coffee at the hotel, a perfect stranger. That's just true, it's Grand Rapids, everybody's nice to everybody, right? But, um, but beyond that, we have a special relationship with each other because I'm giving of my property. I looked at the $2 in my wallet and I said, I value this, but I'd even value a cup of coffee more. And he's looking at my $2 and he's thinking, that looks pretty good. Uh, I like this cup of coffee, but I even value that two bucks more than my cup of coffee. So we arrange this deal, just looking at each other's eyes, we see a chance for us to get together and develop a temporary little association in which our lives are made better off. That's a beautiful thing. And it happens all the time. It happens every day. It happens trillions of times a day. That's what exchange is all about. It's about, about seeing value in what other people have and arranging in voluntary terms uh, a way to enhance our lives, to make our lives better off. Therefore, increase the wealth in the community. Again, without any physical change in the surroundings, that is the generation of value. And that's amazing, and it's beautiful. And we take it for granted so much, and it's pathetic. We shouldn't. We should walk around every day with a sense of growing ever wealthier because of the chance to engage other people in exchange. I think it's a very beautiful and magical institution. And by the way, the way I just described it, uh, the exchange, maybe it sounds very simple to you. It's, it apparently is not, because the ancient philosophers seem to miss it. They all, like even Aristotle, when he writes about exchange, he sees it as just being uh, like a zero-sum game. You know, you trade one thing for another, everybody's moving stuff around. He thinks that uh, all exchanges consist of um, equals for equals. Well, I have some stuff, you have some stuff. If we exchange, it's because they're equal. You know, this is just a fallacy. And, you know, we, we love Aristotle. He was a very smart guy. But he missed this point. It's not about equality. It's about inequality. We have unequal valuations. It's just that they're reversed. Uh, the coffee and the two dollars are not the same. The coffee is more valuable to me than it was to him, and my two dollars are more valuable to him than it was to me. So it's precisely because we have unequal valuations of our respective uh, property that the exchange takes place at all. Aristotle missed this point. Uh, this is extremely important because, you know, actually opponents of the market economy tend to look at all the um, all the market activity that goes on every day in the financial markets, or they look at malls, or they look at Walmart, uh, they look at uh, big commercial districts, and they dis are, they're just disgusted. They look at it and they go, look at all that. What are these people doing? They're just running around, spending stuff, greedy things, you know, materialism, they're grasping for money, desperate for, for food, whatever. It's, it, they're just mortified by it and they're disgusted. You know? They're looking at the same things we look at, but they have a totally different impression of it. And the reason is that they don't understand that there's something about the act of exchange itself that is wealth generating. That every exchange that takes place, at least um, uh, people believe that they're going to get more value out of that exchange before it, uh, after it happens than if it never happens at all. That's, I think, a big difference between the people who have fallen in love with capitalism, as I have, as versus those who haven't. 
Okay, um, let's move on now to defining what I mean by love. And here I'm just going to rely on C.S. Lewis, this is very traditional <coughs> to do so. Uh, four types of love, right? Four types of love? Um, there's that first level, which storge, all from the Greek, right? Um, it's a type of uh, what he calls affection. And he says this in his book, The Four Loves, that the most um, basic kind of affection you can develop for somebody else is when you have a commercial relationship with them. And it's true. I think it's really true. I mentioned earlier that merchants and consumers tend to say thank you to each other. You know, that's really wonderful. It sometimes happens when we go to a store and, and, and you check out and you go, hey, thanks. And they go, no problem. <laughs> There's something rubs us wrong about that, right? And we're like, yeah, okay, I'm glad it wasn't a problem for you, but it would even be better if you were grateful, you know? So that's why we have a tradition of saying thank you, thank you, thank you. We're giving gifts to each other. It's beautiful. You know, I've, you've been to birthday parties, right? You give a gift and the person has to pretend to be grateful, uh, even though they already have one. And they go, thanks, you know, this is really great. I really like it, thanks. But you don't say thank you. Well, I guess you could thank you, thank you for your life or something, but it's not conventional, right? But in the market economy, we have this ongoing birthday party with every single exchange, except it's like birthday for both types, for both people. It's like, thank you, no, well, thank you. No, well, thank you, thank you. I mean, this, this is life in Grand Rapids, I think. This is, <laughs> this is what goes on every single day. That's a wonderful thing. That's a type of love. That's a type of a love um, that, that grows out of having affection and appreciation for another person's role in life. That's nothing to make light of. That's unbelievable. That's how come people um, become valuable. That's how we become valuable to others, and that's how we understand our own value to others. It's not the only source of value, but the existence of exchange itself is a way of validating our dignity as human beings and seeking out others who similarly value us. And I find it just magical, and we should never um, uh, make light of it, because we've come to expect it in commercial society. And for the most part, we do. I'll talk about this later, but, you know, have you ever been involved in a completely non-commercial setting in your life? Like, completely non-commercial. Like, there's nothing, there's no exchange involved at all. I'm trying to think, I was trying to think this morning, what, what would be an example of that? Uh, post office, I'm here, right? Um, uh, standing in line at the TSA, about to get on an airplane, you know. Uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, maybe. Uh, public school, you know. Um, the court system, ouch, right? Um, you're always happy for a friendly bureaucrat, and that's great, you know. Person of good character, they're nice to you. I'm sure you have more of those in the Midwest than, they, than exist in New York, you know. We probably have more in the South, although it's, it's iffy, you never know. Uh, oh, customs is another case, you know. Um, you, you can't really expect that, what C.S. Lewis calls uh, affection, to, to emerge out of those uh, systems. Uh, you're just kind of glad to get through them. It always amuses me at airports, you know, because, um, you know, you're standing in line for the security, and really, you just endure it, really. You know, you're, you're being broadcast this message, say something, do something, say something, whatever the little thing, slogan is. And, and uh, you're always doing something wrong. Hey, don't stand over here, stand over here, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you're, oh, you're supposed to take that bottle out of your bag, don't you know? Oh, I'm so, so sorry. You can't take these scissors on the airplane, and so on. Or as happened to me recently, I'm sorry, that gigantic bottle of, of basil vodka you just bought just can't go on the plane. You know, oh, well. That's just the way it is. Um, and, and people kind of act like, people don't expect affection to arise in those conditions. They just want to survive. They just want to get through them. Then immediately when they cross over uh, the, uh, the line of, of, the, of the TSA and enter into the beautiful, exciting commercial space of airports, which are so wonderful, right? You can get everything and people want to sell you stuff and you can munch on fries and buy jewelry and you know, get some new pajamas or whatever. And, um, and immediately the consumer's in charge, right? But they're now in a bad mood uh, because they just had to go through this TSA thing. So you order, you order uh, and I've, I've, I've done this. I've been at bars before and a guy orders a hamburger and it comes out. The guy said, look, I ordered a medium. This is well done. 
take it back, and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. You know, consumers get extremely demanding, you know, <laughs> in a commercial setting. It's pretty funny because these same people were acting like sheep, you know, just like five minutes earlier in face of the TSA. They're like, yes, sir, whatever you say, you know. Um, they have rights. They have rights in the commercial space. And um, there's an opportunity for, for human engagement and an opportunity to be kind to each other. You know, I always go back to this case that I told you earlier of Bob and Jim. Because uh, Jim could have just raided Bob's cave at night and stolen all of his stuff. An act of hate, an act of resentment, an act of envy, an act of redistribution that doesn't produce wealth. Instead, he became creative, he looked within his heart and said, maybe there's some way that I can be made better off without making him worse off. I've got it. I'll find something to do, some way that I can become valuable to him. So he'll value me, I'll value me, and we'll become valuable to each other. We'll begin the basis of love itself, which begins in affection, the first level of love. The second level of love um, is, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis defines as philia or friendship. And it's a much deeper uh, source of association and, and affection. And we all know what this is. I mean, how is commercial society related to our friendships? I and mean, we know the answer to that reflecting on our lives. We've all worked in commercial spaces. Um, we began to develop really f intense friendships. We start caring about, at a deeper level, people's well-being. It's not just the passing thing, you sell me a cup of coffee. Suddenly you're worried about, like, <clears throat> how's your family? When's your birthday? How's your health? Uh, where are you from? Uh, do we have any mutual friends in common? Uh, the, or your business associates. I mean, we've all worked in businesses. It's not possible to work in a business and not develop uh, uh, meaningful, lasting friendships. That's just what we do. I'm sure Acton holds birthday parties and, and, uh, for, for its employees. And, and as every business does, uh, when an employee leaves, we're sad to see him go. We give him a party. Uh, their, their family members are com coming around at, at Christmas and holidays, and, and you develop a deepening sense of association and, and friendship, the second level of love, philia. It's, it, it, commerce is, a, is a, uh, a, a font of this kind of friendship, very deep. My, my grandfather on my mother's side was a wholesale grocer um, in southwest Texas. And I've never known a man with more friends in my whole life. This guy was incredible. Everywhere he'd go, everybody would love him, and he seemed to love everybody. And every time I would go visit them, we'd always be going to some big dinner uh, with just you know, endless numbers of, of friends within the commercial space. It, it's like this gigantic civil society that just began to develop over the lifetime of being a wholesale grocer. It's a beautiful thing. And without commerce, none of this would be possible. So in that sense, capitalism, definitely leads to a deepening form of friendship called philia. Now I want to talk about the third form. Um, and this is where I get really interested. And I've, I'm going to ask you a slightly personal question, because as I'm talking about this, I want to know whether or not I can sort of tap into something you know, if I may. So, and it's a kind of an exciting question. How many, uh, or who in this room, has ever uh, been in love? Like, like, like real, like, you know what I mean by love? It, like, okay, there's some people, I want to ask again, because there's some people who didn't raise their hands, and I want to give them an opportunity to do that. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in love? Okay, okay, so that's, so you know, so you know then what I mean. Okay, what we mean in English by in love is eros, and it's weird. I mean, it happens to you, and everything changes, right? Suddenly the world was boring, but now it's exciting. Spring used to just come, now it's spring! And the birds used to annoy you, now they're singing beautiful songs. And uh, there's something about being around the person you're in love with that just gives you a certain lift. Um, it changes you internally and changes your perception of the world. And you can't sleep at night, it lasts two or three days. And, uh, <laughs> and your life takes on a different meaning. It's a kind of form of insanity, really. <laughs> and it's so insane that men actually cough up, you know, years worth of salary to buy women diamonds. I mean, that's how, 
That's how crazy love can be. But it's a very beautiful institution, and I think it's something we're constructed to do. Um, I think it's possible that there are people who live their whole lives and never experience love on that level, Eros. I feel bad for them, because when it happens, it's like always a shock. It's like, I had no idea how good life could be before I met this person, before this idea popped in my head that I adore this person. Uh, this person makes me feel valuable, and I value this person just infinitely for that reason, maybe, but for other reasons too. It's just this thing called love. Uh, one time I was browsing through a bookstore, and I picked up a, a book. It was called something like uh, um, Vignettes About Love or something like that. And it was a collection that was assembled in the 1890s. It was nothing but a big collection of what everybody has ever said about love that the guy could possibly find. And it's a great book. You know, there's like infinite ways to describe it. Well, I don't need to tell you that. Listen to the radio, right? <laughs> I mean, the, the number of descriptions of love that exist. Well, anyway, the reason why it's important to reflect on, on this aspect, this, this thing called Eros, is because um, did you know that this precise feeling, this feeling of imagining something new, and throwing yourself into creating something you see but doesn't yet exist by chasing this thing that suddenly in entered your head that wasn't there before and changes your life and sets you on a new direction. This is the driving force behind entrepreneurship. It is. It's not the desperate love of money. If that were it, entrepreneurship, for the most part, would be a stupid thing to do because most everybody fails. Most every new business fails. It's not money. It's the love of an idea. It's imagining some value, some thing that you might be able to create that doesn't yet exist that will make the world a better place. And you can't stop thinking about it until you do the ridiculous and insane and stupid, likely to fail thing of starting a business. It's the only reason you would ever do it. If you were fully rational, you would never do it. Merchant craft is almost always likely to fail, almost always. But entrepreneurs still persist and they love. They're crazy, they're crazy people. They f have fallen in love with an idea. The idea is to make the world a better place to participate in the great project of bringing an element of progress to the world. And if you know entrepreneurs, this is exactly what happens to them. The idea begins to dawn one day, and then it grows, and then it gets more consuming, and then pretty soon that's all you can think about. And suddenly you're dissatisfied with the thing that you are perfectly satisfied with before, and you're willing to give it up and you're willing to make massive sacrifices of your time and your money and everything, your life, your reputation, everything you're willing to give up and risk to chase this preposterous idea of making the world a better place by creating something new. That is Eros. That's what it's all about. And as I say, it's not something we can take for granted. You look at it at downtown Grand Rapids and look at all the, the companies and businesses, try to remember that every one of them began with a, a wacky idea. It, it was a moment of love. I can do this. I have to do this. This is what I was born to do. This idea is possessing me. I can make the world a better place. I can, I can do this. And you go out, you seek funding, you risk it all, you sell your home. There's not a single successful entrepreneur in this country who, who didn't go through uh, massive, massive suffering going into it. And you think about the origin of every business, it's, 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 it's implausible. I mean, long before the company is successful, uh, an, a capitalist entrepreneur has to pay everybody. So they borrow massive amounts of money to pay the workers, to pay the suppliers, to pay, pay, pay building contractors, uh, to engage in advertising. There's a long structure of production involved before the first profits arrive. And even then, you know, profits are, are, are almost impossible to make. You know, in the real world, 
uh, most everything you, all the revenue you ever make as a business is going to pay the debts that you have, to pay your other workers. Uh, all the entrepreneurs I know, uh, they always give the advice in businesses books, CEOs should pay themselves first. You know what? It never happens. It never happens. Uh, business people stay poor for a lot longer time than the people they hired. It's just true. Uh, just that sense of ownership, this is my company, is enough payment, even if it means massive amounts of poverty for years and years and years. And I marvel at this institution, again, made possible through capitalism, uh, by the way. But uh, some years ago, there was a, um, a car plant that opened up in Georgia when Korean cars began to um, uh, move their factories to the deep south and move them out of uh, Detroit and everything. Uh, and there was like practically a, a, a facility the size of a, of, a, of a city being built to house the Kia, new Kia factory. I forget now how many employees it, it, it employs. It, it, it seems like it must be five or 10,000. I could look it up. But um, they began this construction. It was, and, and this plant ex extended over essentially a three mile radius. And they have their own water tower and had to have their own highway infrastructure built. And I was driving along there looking at this thing and all the workers are busy and hundreds of cars are out there uh, and, and thinking, you know what? This can't possibly work. It's gonna take like a year to build this factory, you know? And then they still have to make the cars. Then they have to ship them off to the showrooms. And then they have to actually sell them. And then, you know, the margins of our cars are not so great. It's gonna be years before they make any profit. It, this could be five years, it could be 10 years and even then, they won't even know if they had made the right There's a lot of competition out there. They will never know if they made the right decision until the first customer walks into the first showroom and buys the first Kia. And that's probably three or four years from now. Meanwhile, all of this activity is taking place. It's amazing. And sure enough, it's enormously profitable now. We look at it and go, yeah, look at that, look at that big car company and all their wealth. You know, we should probably tax them. You know, <laughs> this is the working out of a dream. It's the working out of love, of arrows. It's the same thing that you felt in your heart when you met that very special person in your life. That's what entrepreneurs feel. It's, it's, it's like crazy juice. It's the stuff that makes, that causes something to enter your brain and into your heart that seems so real and so possible, and such a mission for you personally. But nothing else has changed about the physical world, and probably nobody else shares it. It's yours, and it's obsessive, and it's crazy, and it's wonderful, and it's a source of progress, and beauty in the world, and improvement. It's why we live in a world of bounty. It's love that gives rise to this glorious institution called entrepreneurship. Oh, wow, look at my time. It is so evil what time does, right? Time is so scarce. Can I just, um, I'm, I'm just going to wrap up here. Um, so one thing I like to do when I think about this, when you think about this element of love, do, do I want to say something about agape? I think I will. Um, in my original article about this topic, I can admit, there's a fourth level of love called agape that C.S. Lewis talks about. It's a perfection of love. It's the love that God has for us and that we ideally, and there are moments when it too has happened, it's not probably sustainable, maybe it is for some, but that same love you give back to God, it's a beautiful moment when that happens, and it's the perfection of love. It's the culmination, it's everything. Um, you know, that love that God has for us, that we feel in special times in our life, and we give back to God, that is the love from whence all other forms of love come. Everything else is an imperfect reflection of that fullness. So there's a linkage between these four kinds of love, between agape and, 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 and eros and philia and storge, you know, all the way down a structure of production of love, if you want to say. But what's the source of it all? The source of it all is that special spark that God put in our hearts and our souls as our creator, the thing that he gave us when he made us. That's who we are. That's why animals don't feel it. That's why human beings do, lower than the angels, in the image and likeness of God. These things that allow us to feel and to be creative and to be rational and to 
develop these kind of intense associations and to dream and accomplish things. This is all a reflection of, of the eternal that's in us. And I know that sounds a little bit mystical, which is why I didn't put it in my article on this topic, but I'm telling you because I think you can possibly understand. So let's imagine a world without commerce. I think in many ways it would be a world without God. I do this in my own mind. I like to imagine going into a community and saying, wow, what's cool about this company? What's cool about this community? What's cool about, the co about this community are its, uh, uh, its, its shops, its shopping districts, its uh, bustling commerce. Uh, it's true all over the world, whether it's Vienna or Salamanca, Spain, or um, San Jose, Costa Rica, New Zealand, uh, Detroit, Atlanta, uh, even the rural communities, you have everything from county fairs to country stores um, and gigantic shopping malls and huge corporations and everything in between. Um, this, is, this, is what's at, this is what life and um, fun and beauty is all about. So I like to imagine everywhere I go, what would this place be like without commerce, without this instantiation of love all around us. And what you see is a barren and dreadful and terrible world of suffering, privation, uh, repetitive stasis, and sadness. It's like if you've ever lived in a town where the economy is declining, you know, where businesses are, are shuddering and where homes are going down in value and people are moving out and the young are not staying around anymore. If you've ever lived in a town like that, it is so depressing because we're not progressing. We're going back because commerce is becoming less and less active and it's terrible. I mean, it puts you in a bad mood. In towns like that, everybody's a little bit grumpy, actually. It's true. Commerce is a source of life. It's a source of our hope. It's what gives us a living reality of the possibility of progress and improvement in our short lives. We need to credit it. Most of all, we need to stop. We need to credit it. That's really important. I watched the State of the Union too. I didn't hear anything about the beauty of commerce in that. Never have. These guys stand up. They tell us how the world should work, and how they're responsible for all good in the world. Not responsible for any bad. They're responsible for all good. But you never hear any celebration of the, the commercial world and the contribution it gives us to. We need to celebrate it and appreciate it. Most of all, I think it would be very wise for us to have systems of government that decline to attack it. That would be beautiful. Every regulation, every tax, every war, every prohibition, every imposition, Every act of public violence that prevents exchange, that puts barriers to the realization of our dreams, to me, is fundamentally an attack on the civilization of love, which is so beautifully instantiated in the world of commerce. In the Middle Ages, there was a, a phrase. Uh, I'd be interested to know if anybody's ever heard it before. It goes, O oh, admirabile commercium. Do you know the phrase? Have you heard it? Anyone ever heard it before? The medieval composers used to love to set it to music because it's so pretty, right? O oh, admirable commerce, O oh, beautiful commerce. Why would we sing that on Christmas? What is that about? The reference in the Middle Ages was to the, it's amazing. The exchange that happened between heaven and earth that gave birth to the Savior. So time got together with eternity and traded. And we got the incarnation. It was a trade. It was an exchange. O oh, admirabile commercium. Beautiful. That's where we get the word commerce. And if you look at Jesus' parables, how many of them deal with commerce? I mean, almost all of them. There's a guy growing grapes and a father passing on money to his son and one wastes the money and the other doesn't. And there's a pearl merchant, he's buying low and selling high. And, and there's a guy building a house and a jerk, he built it on sand, what was he thinking? You know, and you know, Jesus is drawing on commerce in the whole of his teaching ministry. Because it's, it's something that's real and important in our lives. Because it's an expression of love, it's a template by which we can work out 
our values, and also because Jesus knew something about exchange. The Son of God, you know, with the Father, who exchanged time and eternity, and then at the end of our lives we're going to, and with salvation, possibly with salvation, we make that exchange back again. At the end of our lives, we're going to experience uh, the other side of things. This is a beautiful exchange. That's what Christianity, that's a major theme of Christianity. It's a theme of our commercial lives. We let us treasure it, let us value it, let us learn about it. And thank goodness for the Acton Institute for building this institution to broadcast these themes to the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Jeffrey, very much. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not done. We have about 15 minutes. Oh, thank, thank goodness. That's good. Yeah, so you get to hear more from him. So uh, if there's a question uh, that somebody would like to ask, this microphone works really good. And the only thing you have to do is put your mouth very close to the top of it. If you hold it like that, it won't work. So. A, a very, very nice presentation. Thank so you. I'm going to get two questions in, but I'll be fast. You can answer them both if you can answer them fast. One is, uh, and I'll ask the dumb one first, uh, I've heard you speak about Bitcoin before. It'd be fun to hear if you got an update on that. Yes. Yeah. All right, all done with that. Now I want to move on to the other one. There was a book that I read many, many moons ago. I can't think of the name of the author. I'll bet you can. It was commissioned by Andrew Carnegie who asked this guy to go interview all his wealthy friends. Carnegie, of course, was the first billionaire on the face of the planet. And he said, go see if you can dig up all the common denominators that mm -hmm. rich guys have. Right. And, and one of those became a chapter in this guy's book, and it was called Eros. And he made huh. the point that you made, and I have not heard that point made wow. in 30 years, I don't oh, think. Oh, wow. Okay, that's really cool. Um, you know, do you remember the name of the author? Is it? The book's name was Think and Grow Rich. Okay, what year was it written? Okay, uh, there's another author I really like. It's the founder of Success Magazine. It's called Orson Sweat Mard Martin. And he wrote a book uh, called How They Succeeded. And it was, uh, every chapter covered one of, the, one of the great Gilded Age entrepreneurs and looked into their lives, into their history. I highly recommend it. I put it up on free online, actually. How They Succeeded. That's by Orson Sweat Martin, and uh, he he had interviewed all these guys, and they all lived you know just amazing lives, and and found you know all these similar traits. I mean, massive, massive, massive personal sacrifice, crazy obsession, uh, huge amount of creativity, a willingness to learn from other people, to be humble, uh, to serve others. You know, the, that, what you get from that book is like if you're not willing to serve others, you're never going to get rich. You know, it's just never going to happen. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to be obsessive about the needs of others. You're the most outward-directed person in the world. Greedy? Come on. Really. You're going to, you're going to be greedy, you're going to be poor, all right? So that's just the, that's the way it is. I mean, that parable um, of the two, two sons, you know? Well, I don't want to go into that. Hey, let me just leave you with one quick thing about the parables. Can I just tell you something? It's very interesting. Did you know the Good Samaritan was a merchant? He was. All the clues are there. He was on the road, uh, this long road that nobody would ever be on because you'd most likely be robbed and mugged. Why would you be on that road? He didn't have any attendants with him, so he wasn't a statesman. He was carrying some extra money and some extra bandages. He knew the local hotel owner, and he had a credit line of credit with its owner. You know? This guy was a merchant. Yeah, he's a traveling salesman. That was, and, and people, people act like this is some social worker guy. Oh, the good smart social worker. No, he wasn't a social worker. <laughs> Probably selling pots and pans or something. Yeah? I don't know. Um, quickly about book, Bitcoin. Um, you know, five years ago, nobody ever thought that there was a possibility of commodifying information and, and titling it and transporting it uh, across uh, geographically non-contiguous lines anywhere in the world in a way that was non-forgeable and non-reproducible through the internet, and that the blockchain that makes that possible would have attached to it a currency unit which itself would obtain a market value. If I told you that would happen five years ago, you'd say, get this guy out of here, he's out of his mind. This has happened, Bitcoin's only one. Uh, there's, uh, I counted this morning, um, 
on a beautiful site called Brave New Coin, 65 different alternative coins that are available from pure coin to dark coin to, you know, uh, Dogecoin, one of my favorites. Um, it's got a dog on it, I don't know what. Um, yeah, this is the most exciting innovation of our time. Uh, it, just, it just is. It holds out the possibility of replacing national currencies, which have been a source of menace to civilization for oh, 6,000 years. So, uh, yeah, the idea of privatizing currency is pretty extraordinary. We're just at the beginnings of it, uh, but it's really exciting. If you've ever used Bitcoin, you just immediately realize that. I, you know, I was talking earlier about that feeling of love. This is what happened the first time I used Bitcoin. <sighs> <laughs> You know, I stood up from the table and just danced around and sang a song. I've seen the future. You know, that's, that's what Bitcoin's about. Other questions? Yes. Hi there. Um, is this on? Yes. I'm a physician. And oh, there's cool. probably nowhere that markets are mess more messed up than in medicine. And we're kind of at the point now where for a physician to ask for payment is not considered loving, it's probably considered immoral. And that is not even, that's not just the patients, that's actually physicians as well. I work with medical students and there's probably no group of people that are more compassionate and utterly clueless than first year medical students. And there's almost universal support among medical students for single payer free healthcare. Yeah. And I don't know if medicine is completely exempt just because we've given an oath to care for our patients oh. or if there can be, if there, if I would consider that having uh, a market in medicine would be the most compassionate way. It would, it would definitely but how would, would you, how would you speak no, to that? No, I, I totally agree. And we, we have weird views towards this. We think that if we get money mixed up on it, that somehow it becomes corrupt. Um, as if money is not involved in public systems of medical care. You know, you know what the story is. I mean, the more state involvement there is in medical care, the worse the system is, is, is getting. And that, that's been true for the last 50 years. Actually, I would say it's been true for the last 100 years, ever since the first commission came along to regulate medical schools and say who could get in, who couldn't, who couldn't. I, I prefer a, a massive free market. We are so far from doing that. Um, although, the more statist and government dominated the medical sector gets, the more you're starting to see the emergence of these private alternatives, right? And, um, uh, you know, we could... Oh, uh, surgery got paid in Bitcoin. That's cool. That's, uh, maybe I'll go into surgery. That's, uh, <laughs> that's really nice. I'll tell you another sector, and look, your story makes me sad. I, I don't know what to say about it. That's why, that's why the Acton Institute does what it does. It tries to educate people about the beauty of markets. But the further we get away from markets, the more we get like the post office. You know? When Lenin was asked, you know, in the early days of socialism, they said, yeah, but Lenin, I mean, your revolution's fun. Everybody said, you know, love, it's really really fun to have a revolution and everything. But what happens afterwards? How are you going to like, have an economy? He said, look, it's, yeah, that's not even a problem. We'll just set up the economy the same way the US does the post office. You know? We'll just have the whole economy operate that way. And to him, that was a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, this is a mistake, essentially. Um, I'll tell you another area that's very, very frustrating to me. I, was, I wish we had more time together. If you watched Obama's um, State of the Union address, he was kvetching about the problem of childcare. Uh, well, it's too expensive, you know, we don't have enough of it. So we should have a giant government program to give, everybody, give it to everybody for free, okay? So I, I began to think about this. It's like, well, that's not the only answer. In fact, that's not an answer at all. A much better answer would be to figure out why is there a shortage of childcare? I mean, does anybody ask that question? Why is there a problem? I mean, every empty nest mom has a business ready-made for her. Has she got a home? She's got talents and skills and experience. She can make money taking care of people's children. Why doesn't that happen? It's regulation. Daycare in this country is one of the most regulated sectors around. You can't get into the market. And the level of regulation is unbelievable. At the federal level, at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level. And they regulate every every aspect of the business to the point that they, it's a massive discouragement for every, anybody or anybody to get into the industry. It's so cartelized and so ruined by government that there's a massive shortage. There's no reason for a massive shortage in daycare anymore there's a reason for a shortage in carrots or tennis shoes or software. I mean, the, the, there should be an exact meeting of supply and demand in this sector. When that doesn't happen, there's a problem. And that problem 
is massive government regulation. And will somebody please do some work on the subject? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how little writing there is. I wrote an article yesterday called Deregulate Daycare. I think I have the only article on the internet on the subject now. And I, why? Why does nobody care about this? This is a human rights violation. This is an outrage. Somebody needs to do something about this subject. We need to at least start the debate, which is not even taking place. I went through all the scholarly literature on the topic of daycare. Not one person raised the problem of the economic costs of regulation. Not one. For everything I looked through, it's a scandal. This is a problem that can be fixed today without any problem. We're not fixing it because we don't understand it. One more question. Um, I don't. I don't mean to sound like um, cynical or like critical or anything. Yeah, if, uh, none of us are cynical beside besides you. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I was just like the 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 point you made about how um, like the the virtues of Christianity are the same as the virtues of capitalism. I, th to me, in my own mind before this, that was not the case. That uh, Christianity is about altruism and capitalism is about individualism. Yeah. So it seems paradoxical in a way that it does. altruism leads to um, individualism or vice versa. Well, this term altruism is, is, uh, became very popularized in our own world today by, uh, by, by the brilliant and, and visionary Ayn Rand, whom I have, I'm personally devoted to her. Actually. Yeah, that's, that's why, I, um, that's yeah. particularly who, who I had the understanding yeah. from. Yeah, I so, get that. Yeah. So I think she had a, a you know, I think she had a distorted view of Christianity, really. Um, and, uh, wow, there's so much to say about that. But, you know, she, she was alive in a time in the 20th century where there's this big battle between ca communism and capitalism. And she reduced the great ideological struggle to, as a struggle between collectivism on one hand and individualism on the other. And I think that was a valuable rhetorical apparatus in, say, 1950 or the 1960s, uh, stuff like that. I think we've kind of moved beyond that. I'm not sure that that's the best apparatus to understand it. Um, and you know this term altruism itself. You know where she got this, right? It's from uh, a sociologist named Augusta Comte. Uh, Comte, I guess it's C-O-M-T-E. And he called his philosophy uh, 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 altruism. And that guy was a, a, a disgusting totalitarian communist, I can tell you. So that's where our understanding of altruism comes from. Um, so that kind of altruism I'm against. But if altruism by altruism you just mean having affection for others, I don't think Rand would disagree with, with, with that. In fact, I don't think Rand would disagree with anything I said here today. I really don't. Um, I'm in a weird position of admiring her personally more than I do philosophically, actually. I think she's a great hero. I mean, this is a woman who was born uh, d destined to go to the gulags, you know, in, in, in Stalingrad. And she escaped, came to this country at the age of like 17, and landed in Chicago penniless, didn't see any opportunity, got on a bus and went to Hollywood and began to write screenplays. And without any formal education, or any support whatsoever, became one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, writing the second best-selling book of all time compared to the Bible. How do you do that? That's kind of amazing. So you know, we all have our complaints about Ayn Rand, but look, this woman was, was, was amazing. Nobody's perfect. I'm so against intellectual hero worship. Why can't we read people, agree with what, a lot of what they say, and disagree with other things they say? Why don't we do that? Why are we always looking for godlike figures among the intellectuals? I think it's stupid. I think we should stop. We should read everybody and learn from them where they're right and, and reject them where they're wrong. How difficult is that, you know? Please yeah. join me in thanking Jeffrey Chapman. Thank you.